Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Petra Wolfbeis. I'm the Director of Membership with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. I know folks are still joining us, so I think we'll wait a few more uh, seconds and then we'll get going. So as mentioned, uh, I'm Petra Wolfbeis. I'm the Director of Membership with uh, AMO. Um, good afternoon and um, on behalf of AMO and the Rural Ontario Municipal Association, also known as Roma. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as I'm assuming most of you joining us uh, understand that broadband and connectivity is a key advocacy issue for Roma and AMO, an issue that is complex and complicated for many municipalities to na navigate. Um, several months ago, Roma contracted with AMO policy staff to develop resources to support municipal elected officials and their staff in the considerations and discussions that uh, you undertake into local uh, decision making on this issue. Um, so over several months, Amber Crawford, I'm pleased to introduce both Amber Crawford today, who's AMO policy advisor, as well as Craig Reed, AMO senior advisor. They developed these great resources. And as you know, they were released last week. Um, they are here today to walk you through them and answer your questions. Um, so Craig and Amber, thank you very much for your hard work and great work going into this. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you. So um, with that, I, uh, I wanted to uh, give everyone a bit of an overview of what, uh, what we're going to do today and, uh, and what we're trying to do. But before I do that, I think there's some uh, logistics that Amber wanted to go over. So I will turn it to Amber. And we can't hear you, Amber. Okay. Can you do that now? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. So thanks, Craig. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, I've already found the mute button, but actually everyone is muted uh, due to the, the number of registrants that we have today. Um, and so there's there's two ways to participate through uh, the Zoom function. One is through the chat window. Uh, you can chat um, ideally through um, for technical issues if you can't hear or see or you sort of lose the feed. Uh, but you could also chat privately to, uh, to panelists being Craig and myself today. Um, and as well as uh, Brittany, who is our fantastic tech on the call today. Um, the question and answer window is really where we're going to ask people to participate today. And, uh, and that sort of allows us to sort of answer things as they come in in sequence. Um, and, uh, and we'll be answering those live. Um, the slides today is going to be circulated to all of the participants that are on uh, today's call. And the presentation is being recorded um, and will be posted as well. So if there's people that, uh, that either join late or, um, or there are calls colleagues of yours that uh, that weren't able to join, feel free to, uh, to send them the link when it's posted. Um, and what we've done today is sort of broken it up into sections. Um, over the lunch hour, which I hope you have your lunch in front of you, um, we're going to sort of take different breaks. Um, we're going to take probably a five minute bio break, maybe around one if it makes sense. Um, but if there are questions that we do not get to, um, we are going to follow up directly with folks as well. Um, so this is very much the, the beginning of a conversation with, uh, with Craig and I. But with that, I'm going to pass it back to Craig um, to, uh, to take us through some of the context of why we're here today. Thanks, Amber. So today, as Peter mentioned, we've, uh, we're here to take you through some resources that we've put together for Roma. Um, they're available on Roma's website, and I assume that you've all uh, had the chance to uh, go through them a little bit, or at least download them. Uh, the first resource is a connectivity primer, or, or 101. And the second resource is a roadmap 101. Um, and then we will also cover some of the programs that the federal and provincial governments have uh, put together to try and improve connectivity solutions for uh, Canada and Ontario, respectively. Um, we may uh, not get to an entire discussion on those, depending on, on how this goes, but uh, there are links in the presentation um, for you to get more information if you need them. Um, so basically, Roma uh, has been seized uh, for some time um, with uh, the need for better connectivity in rural, northern, and remote areas of Ontario. Um, and very much, uh, I think everyone is aware uh, in these times, um, but this has been building for some time, 
um, that connectivity is no longer a luxury. Um, it's a necessity. And, and Roma has been working to try and improve connectivity solutions for the communities that they represent. It's become a major policy channel uh, challenge at all at the municipal level. Um, and it's fair to say that demand has been growing and uh, people have been hearing from constituents such as seniors, businesses, students, and others um, that they need better connectivity uh, to improve their prosperity and quality of life and, and the ability to do things that they want to do and participate in the modern economy. Um, so we, uh, we worked with Roma uh, to define a bit of a role for ourselves. And I think it's fair to say what we tried to do is um, translate what is a very technical field, that of connectivity, um, into uh, a discussion um, that municipal governments are able to engage with better on a policy and governance uh, uh, sort of uh, viewpoint. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very important to realize, and I think many of you do, that municipal governments don't have a mandated role in telecom. Um, municipal governments do uh, care about uh, community outcomes, of course, and the, and the need for economic development. Um, but the regulatory and policy levers, for the most part, um, reside with the provincial and federal uh, levels of government. That said, municipal governments have been a prime driver um, and communities have been a prime driver in articulating the need for better connectivity across Ontario and, um, and advocating for better solutions. And I think we're seeing some of the outcomes of that with federal and provincial funding um, and, and other programs to help improve connectivity. Um, so with that said, municipalities are part of the solution. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, um, AMO and ROMA are uh, the voice of uh, councils um, to the province of Ontario, uh, uh, being the provincial government and the federal government. Um, ROMA focuses on uh, rural municipal governments and the issues that are particular to them. Um, and AMO uh, is, uh, is the voice of, uh, of elected councils. So we've got some, um, we've got some uh, information there about uh, who we represent, but it's fair to say that these two associations work very closely together. Um, and as policy staff at AMO, we support them both. So um, we are here to talk about the meat of this, which is two documents. Um, as I said, we've tried to translate a very technical field um, of telecommunications into something that is a little more understandable. We understood from, uh, from Roma members um, and, and others that, uh, you know, not only uh, was, was this becoming a bigger issue in their communities, um, but they were having trouble understanding where to start with, uh, um, with connectivity. Um, sometimes proposals would come in um, and it was hard to assess uh, what those proposals would do for a community. Um, you know, there, there are tons of technical terms and uh, all sorts of uh, engineering um, involved in this, and uh, there will still continue to be a role for that. Um, but from our point of view, we were trying to provide some consistent information on, on connectivity. Um, uh, we were trying to create a framework to evaluate the policy decisions and uh, how municipal governments could be involved, create a better understanding of, uh, of what was possible for municipal governments to do, um, and identify actions that councils could take to prepare for those con uh, conversations around connectivity. So if you will, what we really tried to do is build a, a policy lens for municipal connectivity. And it's fair to say that we reached out far and wide. Um, and I, I think some of the folks that were involved with us and helped us out um, and increased our understanding are on this call. Um, and we thank them all um, because uh, they played a, a very, very big role in, uh, in the documents in front of you. And so hopefully um, those documents that Amber is going to, uh, to go through uh, momentarily um, will help councils 
senior staff and others and municipalities and communities generally um, to have a better sense of where to start, how to, uh, what they ought to do with connectivity and what they may ought not to do. Um, and, uh, and as I said, there are two resources and I'm going to bring it over to Amber to take you through them. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, Craig. Off mute on both. So, um, good afternoon again. I just wanted to um, bring you through quickly a summary of just the, the two documents. We are going to, as I say, talk about the primer first. We'll pause for questions um, and then talk about the roadmap. And as Craig alluded to, talk a bit about uh, funding at the end with a, a bit of a break in between. But what I'll do is I'll start right into the primer. And what I will say is as we go through, I'm sort of building, uh, we decided to build a narrative around what it was. So it's not, uh, certainly not by section by section, um, but in terms of how we would explain it to folks, this is, this is sort of the way that, we, that we've outlined it. So as Craig said at the beginning, connectivity has really become almost as vital uh, to a community's economic prosperity as traditional infrastructure, which is things that you are mandated to take care of, such as sort of clean drinking water, electricity, and roads. And so with connectivity steadily increasing, um, we have noticed that it's um, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and most of you on this call will certainly be aware of how major a catalyst for change it's been, but it has not been the only one. In fact, it's it's only one of the latest. And so what we have um, uh, through Roma have done is sort of talk about certain short and long-term solutions to help uh, bridge this digital divide. And, and by digital divide, um, it's going to be really important on this call in particular uh, for Craig and I to define our terms. We've sort of described them by three different gaps, and we're going to speak to each of them in a bit. One is about the availability of broadband service quality, um, and the third is affordability of services. I will say that as we go into sort of the availability of broadband, it is important to know that we do talk about cellular, and it is something that um, both the uh, province and federal government have also um, identified as really important. Uh, but for the purpose of today, most of our discussion is going to be about broadband, but can certainly answer questions um, in cellular as well. As you'll see on slide 11, we talk about availability as one of the criteria uh, that we really see through um, through this digital divide. And it's something that the province has, uh, has certainly quantified. As you'll see, 12% um, is what the province has estimated that does not have sufficient uh, connectivity or connectivity at all. Um, and 9% of roads are still not covered by uh, the latest cellular technology in Ontario. That's, of course, larger at uh, the Canadian level. And, and some of these, uh, these charts and sources um, are from the CRT. TC's uh, Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission's report um, in 2019. And so uh, this is really uh, in Annex A of this report talking about um, the fact that the basic service objective in 2016 um, is the speed of 5010 unlimited data plan. And I think a lot of folks hear it but don't necessarily know what, uh, what it means. And so what we're trying to do is define some of these terms in the paper uh, so that if you're totally new to this, uh, you learn a lot. And if you aren't or in the middle of the process, you, you can still learn something. But as a base level of understanding, um, with the federal government, who, um, who does have a policy um, and most of the regulatory and, and funding decisions in telecommunications, has determined that 100% um, of Canadians by 2030 are to experience speeds of at least 50 megabits per second download and 10 megabits per second upload for fixed broadband services with an unlimited data option. And that, of course, we know does not exist in, in many rural communities. Um, there are data caps, and we'll speak about that. Uh, but also the latest cellular technology should be available along all major Canadian roads, not only just all homes and businesses. And as you can see on the, on the right-hand chart, this just sort of uh, just in one slide shows uh, just the disparity. Uh, we're not going to talk about the disparity. We're just going to say it exists. And so what are we doing to uh, to solve it? So um, another thing that we've talked about criteria wise is service quality. So in our paper, we say that even if it is possible to get online, sometimes it's not sufficient or reliable for things such as latency, experiencing jitter and packet loss. And those again are are, um, are defined in, in, this, uh, in this primer. But the seismic shift towards working from home 
e-commerce, e-learning, et cetera, all of these things have led to quality issues. And what we've noticed in the research that we did um, in the last sort of few months is that not only do urban communities um, have higher download speeds, as you'll see uh, the Sierra uh, chart uh, on your left talks about those download speeds, which is really the, the measure um, upon which a lot of the um, not only the funding, but how you experience things on the ground is sort of measured. Um, but urban communities do have more choices generally in terms of buying bigger packages. So I want to make sure that there's a nuance to this chart, that it does not um, just sort of come across as, as quite a disparity. I will say that 5.5 megabits per second download uh, in July is up from the three point whatever that was in, uh, in April. So it is increasing, however, I will say that the reason why these download speeds are quite high in urban is not only because of choices, but because there is the ability to buy bigger packages. And so that's a really important thing that, that we wanted to make sure uh, was known, but can, can obviously answer questions um, in that later on in this session. In terms of affordability, this is something that um, is absolutely um, essential to, to solve and, and our research and certainly the federal government's research in their, in their report had said urban centers increased by 4% between 2016 and 2019 when you take spending per month on internet. That was more than double what um, or less than half on the corollary for rural communities. They increased by 8.7 over the same time period. And so obviously affordability um, is, uh, is affected by competition, but also these data caps that I mentioned. And so I won't read out loud the quote that we've got underneath, but Basically, the telecom regulatory policy in 2016, which also outlined the basic service objective, which is not a requirement, very important, is that um, the availability of usage monitoring tools and data coverage uh, notifications would provide more certainty and certainly allow um, residents in rural communities to be more empowered to avoid bill shock, which is something that we know many of you face today. What we talk about in the next section is talking um, about the public and private investment that's in this, uh, necessary to solve this divide. And it's very important to understand the um, not only what we are hearing from TSPs, being the telecommunication service providers and internet service providers, um, Together, we call those private telecommunications companies. Those folks are, um, as you will probably have heard, things like uh, there is no business case to move to your community or to connect a certain neighborhood, et cetera. And that is, of course, because they want to achieve the highest return on investment as possible for their shareholders. However, implementing public funding for connectivity infrastructure is something that certainly the province and, and the federal government has mentioned as a priority. Um, and there's, so, there's, there's accountability and transparency measures built in and required to use those taxpayer dollars. And so um, you will also see this, uh, this tension between private sector that would like to build if they do want to build in that community and the public taxpayer dollars that are, um, are required to build those. And so together, they really do have to work in tandem. And so the necessary solution we say in the paper is that both governments and industry have to work together to leverage those opportunities. And at the same time, public investment has to create conditions to allow these private companies to use their capital to serve people longer term and invest to keep services current. And this is what we talk about in the roadmap a bit later is about the, the notion of future proofing and making sure that it is not just that a company comes in and provides you a service and then does not come back around to increase that service. As we know, it's a, a much longer uh, conversation and a uh, and need for, for funding longer term. So what we say in the paper is about the need to build a community business case. And I think this is a really interesting thing that, um, that certainly Roma picked up on and, uh, and many of its members is the idea that the benefits that connectivity brings are much larger than what a private sector business case would include. So um, whereas private sector typically depends on the economics, obviously, um, and not all of it. I'm not to say that, um, that other uh, indirect benefits can come from it, but it really is a public sector that can talk about all of those sort of economic, social, and environmental benefits that come from connectivity funding. And in fact, that investing in broadband uh, could alleviate some pressure from funding in other ministries. So as you'll see on the bottom right, we sort of created this, this map of all of the things that connectivity can do to improve it. So be it leisure and entertainment, you've got public safety that, um, you know, instead of asking for um, community safety 
funding, it could alleviate it through Ministry of Infrastructure funding. Um, working from home and government services and elections could be on there and uh, take sort of um, take pressure off from funding for for those uh, types of activities that otherwise would be sort of funded in silos. And so what we're suggesting in the paper is that councils really understand the unique opportunities that connectivity brings and discuss them in a broader conversation about whether or not to play a role in, in funding connectivity. Another important piece, we won't spend long on it, but it is important for context. Uh, we put this in appendix because uh, it is quite lengthy and I will um, happily defer to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities who have telecommunications um, in their bailiwick. And so what we've tried to do in this paper is just sort of differentiate the differences in roles. And we'll speak about that when we talk about championing the need for connectivity in the roadmap portion of this presentation. But certainly the regulatory oversight powers do lie with the federal government through three acts primarily, of course there's others, but telecommunications, broadcasting, and radio communications. The province um, does not regulate the telecoms industry directly. However, uh, there are many things that it's interested in because of economic development purposes, COVID recovery, and the building of economic prosperity for all Ontarians. And so the boxes below just sort of summarize the different departments. We can get into it in questions, but won't uh, won't at this point. But I think the, the key differentiator here is that I said and CRTC um, are the two that sort of function at that uh, at the federal level. And the province really deals with um, with ministries such as energy, also OMAFRA, so food and rural affairs, uh, regulates the OEB, which regulates um, hydro pole attachment rates, and of course, the Ministry of Infrastructure. Before you're like, holy crow, this is a lot of words. I'm not reading them out loud to you. Don't worry. They are in the uh, they are in the paper. But all to say that um, as you go through, we have recommended a series of actions that municipal governments believe um, that advocacy is required to change. And I think this gets to Craig's earlier point about the fact that we don't have a mandated role in telecommunications. As you can see, a lot of things are about providing a fair and consistent environment, leveraging the investments that they have made and making sure that technologies evolve. From the provincial level, it's talking about advocating to the federal government to expedite the rollout of funding, which of course we've seen and can talk to a bit later, um, but leveraging the, the uh, nearly $1 billion in provincial broadband investment, which we think is, is fantastic. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but also additional supports, modernizing the OEB, and then reviewing provincial assets such as towers, buildings, land, utility poles to optimize this connectivity are all options and, and choices that we think um, people ought to uh, to advocate for in addition to building community um, a community business case for connectivity. Finally, there is a role for utilities and the private uh, companies to play. Um, uh, talking about the development and sustaining of relationships with municipal governments is really important. Talking about what barriers really do exist um, and pushing back if there are things that, um, for instance, utility companies hear that they don't feel is either um, not misconstrued, but maybe not uh, misunderstood, I would say, and vice versa. So um, talking about developing and sustaining relationships throughout um, what we're going to talk about next, which is sort of the mapping, identifying assets, et cetera. These are all important things to do. And so that's, that's the, um, the part that we say in that primer of the paper. And then finally, Appendix C. One of the things that we had heard from our members when we were developing this was the fact that learning from other people that have already done things or are grappling with similar questions is something that the sector um, hasn't done enough of. And I mean, we could um, we could talk about what we're thinking about in 2021, which is about sharing these resources um, sort of more uh, consistently through this uh, a webinar format such as this, if, if you think this works well, this is the first one that we've done, but you'll see an, an outline of just the different ones that exist throughout the province. And so we really do um, encourage you to, uh, to take a look and to see what your neighbors are doing. Um, I will of course let um, Craig explain Barn a little bit later, but Broadband for Rural North, which is um, an international example, which is quite cool. And so, um, but we, we've added that as well. And so with that, I'm going to stop and invite Craig to come back on. And uh, I'm not sure because I can see the, uh, the slides. I saw a couple things through the chat. So give me just a second and we'll see if we can, uh, we can either group these questions together. Craig, I'm not sure if you want to, um, if you've seen some of the questions come in to get us started. 
Uh, at this point, if not, I will just um, throw them to us. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so okay, so for the people that are looking for the chat function, by the way, I will say that it is in. For some of you, it will be under more with the three dots. Um, and for those of you that don't, um, and it, for those of you that don't see the Q and A, it's just in the uh, to the left of the um, share button for you, or it should be right beside the participants. So, um, Craig, I will as we're waiting for some questions. If not, I'm happy to uh, to go right into the roadmap. But did you want to jump in about some of the um, your experience with some of the models and? Uh, and I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to speak to uh, to the barn one. To the barn one. Amber always gives me the opportunity to speak to the barn one because I always speak to the barn one, it turns out. Uh, barn is one of my favorite examples for, uh, for Roma. Um, and I, I don't even remember how I came across it now, but basically um, it, it is broadband for rural north. It's in um, Lancashire in England. Um, and it's, uh, it's basically a, an example of a community um, that had tried for many, many years, um, decades to get better uh, internet and broadband services. Mostly um, one of the, the people behind it was, was really trying to check in on her father um, in, uh, in a, a long-term care home. Um, and uh, they, they didn't have any uh, success with funding, but um, uh, one day uh, this person who was also a hairdresser was cutting uh, apparently the mailman's hair, so the, the story goes, and uh, the mailman said, uh, you know, what are you all so worked up about? You're all farmers, you've got backhoes, why don't you dig your own trenches and lay your own wire? Um, so they started up a cooperative, and that's exactly what they did. Um, it's very close to, to what happened in, in other parts of, uh, I, I think it's Saskatchewan and Alberta, some examples. Um, but apparently they've managed to, uh, to take this rural community, very low population density relative to the rest of, of England, and turn it into uh, to something that it has some of the best internet available. Um, we do have a question that's come in, um, in the meantime. There you um, go so though, Craig. Thank you, Chris. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about Barn. Um, but, uh, Chris is asking, how far do you think the funding will go? Um, and, uh, in other words, at the end of the process, will there still be those without? Um, so that, I think that's hard to say, Chris, I think that will be, uh, dependent on um, how much can be leveraged for uh, from the private sector. And I think um, in addition to that, um, how far technology moves. So part of what we've tried to say in these documents is that uh, this funding needs to lay the basis for a sustainable investment environment longer term. Um, so uh, you know, I think uh, there's there's not an inconsiderable amount of money on the table, nearly a billion dollars from the province of Ontario, uh, 1.75 billion from the federal government, plus other uh, funds that the, the federal government has made available, um, quite quite a substantial amount, but that's, uh, that's the UBF program, the Universal Broadband Fund program that we're talking about. Um, there's other funding uh, from the federal government through the uh, investment bank and through um, uh, the CRTC and others. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll have to see. And I, I think it'll be a, a, an interesting, um, it'll be an interesting question. But I think what we can all say is that there's no way um, that the, that these gaps can continue to exist any longer um, to the extent that they have. Um, and I think we will be looking at uh, a perpetual improvement. Thanks, Craig. Just wanna make sure. We have a comment here. I appreciate the funding. Nine years, however, is uh, 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 nine years away to a hundred. Understood. Um, I think it is, it is Definitely 
uh, a fair point to be made that uh, that we're behind the eight ball um, on this, and uh, and the you know we are seeing um, years of policy decisions and uh, and market decisions um, and the weight of those decisions coming to uh, to light, um, but. I think it's fair to say we stand a better chance of closing that gap now or narrowing that gap um, for those rural residents um, and Northern residents uh, than we ever have. And new technologies should help uh, in, the, in the near to, well, medium to, to near term. Absolutely. Ever? Yeah, and I think the, just to sort of build on those points, I think the um, elected officials at all levels are hearing similar things, which I think is all helpful pressure towards building momentum about, um, you know, this is certainly something that, um, as I say, it's a large catalyst, but certainly not the only one. And so in this research, it's certainly not something that um, is also just noticed by Ontario. Um, part of the research Craig and I have been doing is, is working with other uh, provinces and territories as well to make sure that um, that sort of the, the projects and, and we'll speak to in the next section are, are really shovel worthy as well as, uh, as shovel ready as, as when those funding come in. So uh, Craig, did you wanna? Uh, no, I just, uh, we got another question yep. uh, coming in, which is about technologies, and I, I think we kind of opened the door for it. So let's uh, let's see if we can uh, answer it, uh, or at least start to answer it right now. Okay. Um, discussing the impact of Telesat and US Starlink on, on connectivity programs. Um, so if by connectivity programs, you mean the funding, um, at this point, uh, there is some federal funding available for um, for low earth orbit satellites as was uh, announced in the budget, I think uh, two years ago. Um, and, uh, and there's some more available for Telesat um, in, in this budget now, um, or this, this update rather. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the, those, um, those two uh, technology solutions uh, will not have a, a huge impact on either the Universal Broadband Fund um, availability nor the Ontario ICON funding availability. Um, that said, you know, as we get closer to seeing those those uh, those options move toward market viability or move toward market, um, really, I think it, it's fair to say that those could be. Uh, really, really important for uh, for folks who live in more remote areas of, of the province and, and the nation, um, and where it would always be uneconomical to run cable or um, or the ability to uh, to do uh, uh, wireless internet. Um, that said, um, you know, it's not as if it's one technology versus the other technology. They all work together. Um, and you may see that uh, it is possible to um, have those low earth orbiting satellites become more of a community um, wireless internet solution in the longer term. Amber, is there anything you want to add to that? I think just to say that they are, um, those companies operate quite differently. So Starlink, as we understand, is going to be a direct-to-consumer um, offering, whereas Telesat is not. It works through ISPs. And so I think just to sort of differentiate, and we can, we can speak about that in, in some of the later sections, and we'll get into that next, but just to say that uh, there are a lot of options that um, that certainly speaks to the sort of shorter term sort of stopgap measures than and the long term advocacy that's both needed and both are really important to to do almost in tandem. So what I'll do is if it's OK, what I'd like to do is sort of go through um, because I think these questions about funding, I just want to make sure that we get to and I think they they wrap really well with the roadmap. So the, the questions that did come in, we'll start with those in the next section, certainly, but I just want to make sure that as we're sort of going through, I want to get um, a sort of picture around what municipal governments can do if they so choose to get involved in connectivity. And I think this gets to some of the issues um, about funding and, and when to apply, et cetera. So the purpose of this really was to sort of show folks that the roadmap A is a nonlinear process. And so in the research that, that Craig and I did for Roma and in our conversations with folks, what we had put forward initially was sort of a step-by-step 
sort of linear map and that's not at all the case. And so what I like about the, the graphic at the bottom is the fact that the components are all um, sort of intertwined in a sense. There are some stages that will need to be repeated, um, take greater time for instance. And there are some that, uh, that really do have to happen at the same time and, and we'll go through them. So the way that we've sort of presented this to you um, is to show you sort of each of the components that we've put forward, explain with some of the examples and then next steps for councils to consider. And so what we wanted to do here was not to sort of give you all the solutions in this presentation, but rather to speak to some of the, some of the options that exist. And then as we go into the, the question section, answer them there. So the first component that we thought was really important was for councils to identify the state of connectivity in their municipalities and to figure out what assets really exist within your own boundaries. And I think, you know, let's start with within your own boundaries. I think a lot of folks, as we were going through these and presenting some of the main ideas, there are some that are saying, you know, I don't know where to start. And I think the good news is, is that you can start as um, as within your, your boundaries, within your own staff. And so the first thing that we're suggesting is to learn the basics, not to suggest to become sort of IT experts, but certainly understanding the terminology and terms is really going to help you when you get um, approached by some of these telecommunication service providers and internet service providers who are looking for information. Um, we thought this was particularly timely because, of course, those two funds are now open and we'll speak to that. Um, however, making sure that you know what, what, you're, what it is that um, they're looking for is really important. One of the other things that we had seen as a best practice was establishing a cross-departmental working group on connectivity. And that was from a lot of IT folks that were saying, you know, I'm working from connectivity from this part, but I had no idea that my public works and my roads folks were working on it from that side. And I don't know where um, or when those roads are getting built up. And so I can't necessarily work across. And um, there's other ones that have um, strategy advisors within mayor's offices. So how those all work together, we're suggesting, you know, maybe establishing a working group within your municipality uh, to talk it through. It doesn't need to be extensive, but just people that, um, that, that touch connectivity in different ways um, and getting them talking to each other and figuring out what each, each other is doing. The other thing we talked about is the use of mapping tools. And we'll speak to that um, in uh, both the availability map and the eligible eligibility mapping tool that exists right now under the uh, Universal Broadband Fund, but to understand what service levels are um, either advertised and experienced on the ground. One of the things that we hear from our rural members quite often is, yeah, you could tell me that I'm, that I'm supposed to be up to 50, 10, but on a good day, I'm like 10 and, and one. So 10 megabits per second download, one megabit per second upload. Um, and so what's really important is to look at what connectivity the federal government and the provincial government think that you have and then maybe you know map out what what you actually think is experienced the other thing is to identify early on what stands in your way a better connectivity and that could be anything that could be things like utility poles that exist uh, that talks about land it talks about rights of way all of those things and so that's really the biggest piece of it um, that seems overwhelming. And so we'll talk about a bit about how, how we can make that less overwhelming, but it is really a data collection exercise for one with the right people around the table. The second component that we talked about was, okay, based on what you are doing, and at the same time, you really need to understand what the true drivers are and assess the needs against those and then find solutions for those. So what we've talked about is this needs assessment, which is just sort of a just a, a policy term everyone hears, but really what is it dri that's driving the need for it? What are you hearing from your students, your families, your businesses, your seniors? Is it that they're going to McDonald's to upload work? Is it that um, certain long-term care homes don't have access at all to any fiber or certain low-income neighborhoods have been completely missed? For instance, these are all anecdotal information that we've heard and so we said, you know, determine what areas in within your municipal boundaries are the biggest, greatest need for connectivity and then match those solutions. So we are not to say, um, and this is really important to sort of, um, and should have said it at the outset, my apologies, but Roma and Amo are absolutely agnostic to any technology company or association that wants to bring connectivity to your community. And so when we ask questions about, you know, one company versus another versus a different type of technology, the point that we are trying to do as policy staff for you folks is to say, here's all of the possible solutions. It's up to you in your own local decision making um, to figure out the circumstances and, and needs. So Craig, did you? Yeah, you just, sorry, Amber, you just I just came wanted in to add to that very, yeah, very go quickly. Ahead. Yeah, um, jump in whenever. 
uh, that uh, you know we we are focusing on rural and northern and remote communities in these two documents. Um, but we also hear quite regularly, as, as Amber's comments sort of lead you to understand, um, that uh, there are areas within urban regions or um, ex-urban, ex-rural areas type of uh, in between um, that, uh, that really do have these problems with connectivity as well, almost on the, on the same level. Um, so we've tried to come up with a, a, a way, a, a bit of a, a framework for everyone to understand how to deal with that uh, through process and policy rather than sort of focusing only on uh, on rural. So I just wanted to that's add that. Point. Thank you. No, that's a great point. And I think the other anecdote to that point is I can see the CN Tower, but I can't get connected. So it's absolutely something that uh, that is felt in, in urban areas as well throughout the province. Um, and that's and that's just broadband, that's not cellular. So we could talk about the North as well. In terms of component three, this is something that we put third, of course, um, all of these are sort of to be discussed as a, as a sort of overall strategy, but recognizing that you do not have to play a role if your municipality does not want to. It is not a mandated role. So this is not something that sort of come out of the blue that is to suggest that, um, as you see in the spectrum of options on the, on the top right, you do not have to own your own broadband network. And in fact, um, you know, Craig and I are the first ones to say that's likely not a sustainable option for many of you. And yet, um, on the other side of things, letting the market operate on its own is what's happening now and so that is absolutely an option that you can continue the status quo should be one of the things that you evaluate but there's also possible municipal roles in between those and so what we've suggested in this component is to talk as a council and be honest about the level of digital capacity and resources that are available so as you're evaluating these different options learning from other municipalities which is something we spoke to a bit earlier about who's grappling with this question what did they start talking about and what expertise is there to learn from because what you are going through in your own councils and your own areas and regions is not uh, different from any other ones because um, not only the the COVID pandemic has sort of put everyone into this sort of overnight work from home scenario as you'll see here um, but it is an order of magnitude really but but a lot of the issues are the same and also once the rule has been established at any point and that's one of a longer term sort of strategy but you have to really recognize the importance of sustaining that rule so this is not a point in time exercise where we say you know here here's what we're going for you really have to to sustain it uh, particularly if you're going on to um, sort of the the right hand of of that spectrum in between those, we said component four is to figure out what potential tools you already have to manage connectivity needs. This could be its own webinar in itself, but in essence, what we're saying is there's lots of tools that already exist in the purview of your own municipal governments. Um, you could create things like bylaws and permits. Um, to protect municipal assets is really important. We are not to suggest that putting forward things that inhibit or prohibit um, telecommunications companies from coming in. Um, I know that there's another sort of issue where they're not coming in, and we'll talk about that in a little in a little bit, but. For those that are having people sort of come to you and companies come to you asking for support in, in any of these applications, for instance, it's important to know that you, there are tools to use. And so you should be asking staff about how to protect those assets because there is accountability and transparency around taxpayer dollars. The other things we suggest is that a staff person that's responsible for procedures and processes across departments, and this could be part of the working group um, sort of exercise number one is to figure out where to simplify where possible and where is still accountable, but simplify processes. So one of the things anecdotally we had heard from one of the companies um, that provide internet services is they were saying what's really helpful is to have sort of a conduit or a one window person in a municipality so that I can go to one person as opposed to different departments. And so it's things like that. How do we sort of think about not necessarily making it, um, you know, uh, losing track of certain um, steps, but trying to simplify the process so that it um, it can go a, a little bit smoother project wise. And then finally, this is something that um, that folks across all industry and governments have said is that the laying of conduit and fiber where possible um, at the time of construction is going to be the cheapest. So um, when you're ripping up roads, you should be talking to your uh, to your folks that are dealing with connectivity to figure out how you can sort of dig once as the policy is sort of states. Um, and there are some examples of, of those that um, that have put those in already. 
the biggest thing I will say is component number five. And this is, of course, sort of step zero, but also one, two, three, four is championing the need for connectivity. So as a council, we really do need to make sure that the data that you're identifying in your connectivity is is connected to a narrative, because I think as, as you folks all know, when you're talking to residents, being able to tell uh, the uh, province and the federal government about the lost opportunities to your communities without broadband is going to be really important. And so identifying local champions, be it students, families, businesses, seniors, to tell your story will be important. Um, we also suggest leveraging the advocacy power of ourselves and other organizations locally. Um, as I would say, FCM as well has done a lot of work on rights of way and um, telecommunication space on sort of who does what and what responsibilities are where. But also when you're meeting with federal members of parliament, it's important to differentiate as, as we say in appendix B in the primer is talking about what can you do to advocate to CRTC and ISED, which is separate from MPPs about the community needs and resources. And I say um, one of the biggest differentiators is this idea of an essential service and the, the need to advocate for it to be talked about as a sort of the new electricity or things as, as some folks say that is really a, a federal decision that's going to have to be made and so if that's what your council decides to do and advocate for um, then that's something that that's federally related and then MPPs um, obviously for funding through the ICON program but also sort of those those sector benefits those soft things about um, e-government e-learning things like that and so with that I will I'll pass it to Craig to um, to add his two cents on, on this. Actually, just one cent. It's uh, <laughs> just quickly, we had a question come in on the chat um, that uh, I was going to take sequentially, but I figured uh, you were talking about something um, that, that related to it, so uh, I would deal with it. So it comes from Denny Dorval. He says, I'm an elected official from Northern Ontario. Um, who should take the lead and make sure our region is not forgotten? Is it the role of the Regional Technology Development Organization? Um, and I think as Amber has, uh, has been talking, um, you know, it, it, it really is up to council to decide what role you want to play. If, uh, if the technology development organization is working for you, then absolutely. Um, but there are, there are various opportunities and various organizations. Um, but I will say that we are seeing probably the most success or hearing that the most success comes from um, or comes to communities where council is engaged, um, where uh, residents are engaged. Um, and this is, uh, this is something that is a priority. And it doesn't mean that, that that council has to take the responsibility for funding this. There are various organizations, but, um, but as Amber noted, you know, it does come down to the advocacy priority of council. Um, there may be some policy priorities uh, that you put uh, put down, or some uh, um, some funding of your own, depending on on what role you want to play. Um, or you, you know, you can make it easier for for companies to do business, as as Amber was saying. Um, but uh, but council needs to make that decision to to really understand um, how best to to shift. Uh, into um, into improved connectivity for your for your local organization. That's Thank it. you. Um, and and thanks for that because I I can't see the the questions come in so appreciate that and jump in whenever. But I think the other thing to make sure that we recognize, similar with this whole sustainability issue about how do you sustain the momentum, it is about building digital capacity. And uh, and there's a chart that I'll show you on the next slide, but is is really more pertinent to component five is, is the digital capacity of a community is really, really important. And to make sure that whatever systems you're advocating for um, enhance digital inclusion um, and are viable for the end users that, that use it. So um, part of that, as I'll go to sort of uh, component number six, is talking about investing strategically in shovel-worthy projects, um, as opposed to shovel-ready, although if you do have those, um, that's certainly something to continue investing in. But I'm talking about the ones, um, the communities that are really interested in sort of how, how to begin. And what I'll say, um, and I think this gets to some of the funding questions that I've seen, is um, especially to Chris's point, is that when this funding um, is over, what, what's next, right? And I think the important thing to say is that there are 
really interesting different models of other people that are coming to the table to fund it, whether it be sort of private equity firms, for instance, in these micro projects that are smaller than these sort of large impact projects that the federal government is, is advocating for the rapid response stream of those sort of smaller projects that are supposed to be sort of done by the end of November as we'll speak about, but as you think about it and you look at this digital readiness roadmap that's provided by um, a researcher out of um, Brandon, Manitoba, you know, you sort of see this framework of, of you have to be ready digitally. So you have to really invest in your people and you have to make sure that if there are things like um, coding, geographic information systems or where to get GIS sort of help, um, but also knowing, and it's not, it's not necessarily recreating the wheel, it's, it's investing in people that can then figure out where it is that you're going to pull some of those resources from. So, um, and there are plenty of people throughout the province that do just this. And so it's important that not only on the people side, but the projects um, are being invested in. And wherever possible, this is this future proofing technology. And it's something that we continue to grapple with, but obviously projects that are more scalable and future proofed um, using those technologies wherever possible is important because if you were to, for instance, not lay fiber, um, that's the only real sort of, through our research at least, um, the only real future-proof technology, whereas satellites um, are things that are obviously continuing to evolve. And so what's really necessary is whatever you're going to um, invest in, you really do have to sort of evaluate what does this look like in, in 10 years to the point of sort of continuing to, uh, to sort of evolve this technology because it, it cannot just be a project that's sort of done and then left on its own because technology will continue continue to evolve as we've seen. Finally, this issue about performance measurement targets is something that federally um, is something that we think is important to advocate for in the sense that similarly, when we use public tax dollars and municipal projects, the same should really ought to apply to these telecommunications companies. And I think one of the things about letting the market operate on its own, which is something that's been happening for, for the last you know, few decades, is that telecommunications companies um, are, are providing service to a certain standard that on the other end, the end users are saying they're not experiencing on the ground. And so how do you tie those companies to make sure that the targets that they're being funded to do are actually achieved? Finally, partnering. Partnering said six times on the slide and we cannot understate it enough. We talk a lot about gathering information within your own community to start, but it absolutely does need to include neighboring municipalities to leverage economies of scale at, at the right time. And also local institutions and public sector organizations within your boundaries as well is something that you can sort of leverage um, and, uh, and make it a bit more palatable of a business case potentially for, for these private telco companies. Finally, the need to build relationships with the telecommunications service providers and the internet service providers in your community is really important as you are identifying the existing assets. So if there are things that you are saying, uh, for instance, you're looking at the, the federal map and you see things that you're like, oh, I don't know if that's actually experienced on the ground reaching out to your your companies that are in your uh, in your communities will be really important and that way as you're building those relationships when the data is collected and money flows it's a lot easier to identify sort of who exists in your area currently recognizing of course that many municipal um, elected officials on this call will know that they are economic develop um, development they're they're businesses that exist in your community and they and they staff um, a lot of your residents so it's important to figure out what incumbents um, or pre-existing companies exist as well as ones that want to come to your community to give people sort of a quick tip guide, these are these are things that if you are just sort of saying to Craig and I, I'm out of here, this is too much, um, this, we don't have staff for this. What we're saying is those with limited resources, here's some three, three tips to sort of get started or staff to bring forward to councils to say, you know, these are things that are obviously long, longer term, but building leadership is important, increasing your own institutional awareness by using um, staff expertise and, and investing in people and then understanding understanding what it's going to take to make uh, yourselves infrastructure ready are sort of three, three starting points that we're suggesting um, to get started with. So key takeaways, I'll start and then I'll, I'll defer to, uh, to Craig to, to highlight some of these points. So it's not intended to overwhelm. This material is intended to help. And if your council hasn't started on these things, it's 
it's okay because it is just the start of the conversation. It is not a mandated um, role that you ought to play. Um, the mapping, and I think I saw a quick question about it and we'll, we'll get into it, but mapping a community's connectivity is something that the Canadian Internet Registration Authority has already done a lot of work with. Um, so the acronym is CIRA and what they do is they, um, they're in charge of all the .ca domain names. Uh, but the other things that they do is they give back to sort of the broader internet community. And so one of the things that they've done is create a mapping system or an internet performance test whereby uh, your residents can voluntarily provide um, data into that, either in partnership with you or separately. Um, and that is that sort of feeds in um, to, the, to the mapping that's available at the federal level as well. So that's something to be aware of that you do not know do not need to go procure your own mapping specialists. Um, there are a range of models and options to choose from to fit um, a community's priorities and circumstances. So obviously, we always say one size doesn't fit all, and it really doesn't. And, and circumstances might change between the range of models that you need from one community or one neighborhood from another. So don't, don't think that one solution is going to fit all within your own community. It's not a point in time exercise, but a longer term effort. Um, and so the champions in your community are going to be very important. And finally, that Roma, Roma is here and happy to help. And we'll, we'll leave you with some links at the end about sort of the, the websites that we've got. But Craig, do you want to um, sort of highlight any of these and, and add your, your two cents? Well, I, I want to uh, maybe pick up on um, uh, CIRA and uh, sort of points two and three in particular. Um, so, and the reason why is there are a couple of questions that came in that I do want to start to deal with. Um, so basically, I think um, some folks were asking about where to start with internet speed tests um, in your communities, just to, to make sure um, communities are getting what they want. So as Amber said, it's best to start with the, uh, the um, those that are providing services to your community, the TSPs and ISPs. Most uh, services will have a speed test that, uh, um, that uh, residents and, and customers basically um, are able to, uh, to test against their plans um, to make sure that they're getting the download speeds that, that are advertised um, and the upload speeds for that matter. But I also believe CIRA has um, an internet uh, or a test on their website that you can access. And there are lots of other options um, that you can Google as well. And the important thing is to do um, a few of them and make sure that, uh, that you're triangulating to, uh, to an average uh, sort of speed. Um, so I think, uh, I think that was a question that came in. Uh, the other question uh, that came in was about who should be advocating for um, Northern Ontario um, and, uh, and who should be applying for funding such as the UBF. It was a question about uh, the federal minister saying the fund is open to municipalities, but uh, Blue Sky Net uh, was handling that as well. So the UBF is open to municipalities as well as, uh, as other entities. Um, to make applications for uh, improved connectivity. And it really does depend on what role the municipality wants to play. If you're content with, uh, with the idea of Blue Sky Net or your economic development um, uh, folks taking that lead, um, then, then that's fine. Um, if, uh, if, on the other hand, the municipality wants to, uh, to take a, a greater lead in, uh, in applications, um, then you're encouraged to do so. It depends on what you want to see as an outcome for your residents. Um, I do know that both of those uh, um, applications, or both of those programs rather, require a council resolution. Um, to uh, to say that council is aware of the project and uh, and supports it, um, so that is that's one thing to be aware of as those uh, those applications come in. Um, there was a another question that came in. Um, do, do, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to look for it. Amber, I don't know if you want yeah. to add anything while I do. No, I think I think you answered that one 
quite effectively. I think it's just there is, um, it really just speaks to the fact of, of getting out and speaking, um, getting your staff to speak to the people that already exist. Um, that, those incumbent, um, it does not just mean incumbent uh, companies, but other ones, um, including ActDev, as, as Craig alluded to, are really important. So if, uh, if it's okay with you, I know we wanted to get to some of the other funding questions, but I, I think we've got a number of questions that have come in. So maybe yeah. we should uh, take them one at a time. Yes. Um, so uh, the first question that comes in is from Gilles Laderout. Uh, Gilles says, um, what are the timelines or dates for getting Northeastern Ontario communities up to speed with this broadband incentive? On the, intro, uh, on the infrastructure and funding that. Um, so great question, Gilles. Uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that the timelines that have been put out are uh, by the federal government, which is that uh, all Canadians should have access to um, 50, 10, 50 um, megabit uh, upload, uh, 10 download speeds uh, by 2030. Opposite. Sorry, <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> 50 uh, download, download, 10 upload. And, and upload. Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, that, that's completely correct. Um, and uh, by 2030, and they have an interim target in there, uh, which the UBF is intended to, uh, to move the yard sticks towards. Um, so 10 years is a long time. I think they uh, said they wanted uh, up to 90%, I can't exactly remember in, in the recent- uh, 95 uh, by 2026, I believe. Five by 2026, there you go. Um, so that is the timeline that's out there that everyone is working towards. Um, but that said, um, that, is the, uh, that is not the ceiling, it is the floor. So it is entirely possible um, that there will be areas of Northeastern Ontario perhaps even all of Northeastern Ontario connected uh, before that time, hopefully. Um, are you aware of any collaborative online mapping tools? Uh, I think we dealt with that one in terms of where you could do mapping. There are some, there are lots of tools out there and uh, we encourage you to use uh, all of them um, or many of them so that you get uh, at least an idea of uh, the speeds that are being reported, but the best place to start is with uh, the service providers in your area. Um, on identify the state of connectivity, this is from uh, Yarda. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Um, do you have a suggestion for a common language so all municipalities can report it to the Roma connectivity group? Um, so we have, so <laughs> In terms of the common language, it is difficult uh, because, as I said at the outset, um, this is such a technical area, uh, so engineering heavy. Um, we have really tried to, to provide common definitions in this, and we're hoping that uh, as we move along and councils and municipalities and communities become more comfortable with connectivity, um, that this language will become more commonplace. Um, in terms of uh, connectivity, I think it really comes down to um, where you are on the mapping that has been developed by, um, by the, uh, the ICED um, uh, department and the, the federal government and the CRTC um, to, uh, against the speeds that, that you should be having. Um, but once, once you're there, then I think, you know, basically I've been referring to these documents as a foundational briefing for, um, for municipal governments. And so the idea is that this is, uh, this is to provide a common language and framework that we can all uh, understand connectivity through. Um, is there a model where an ISP will be willing to provide CRTC connectivity? I can't see this as the IASPs are profit driven. Um, this is from Barbara Bridgman. So uh, I'm not sure where to start with this one, um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, ISPs are definitely um, driven by profits, but 
they're also driven by policy and um, incentives that are that are there. And the uh, the UBF and ICON uh, programs are there to try and um, you know reduce the barriers to entry that they've seen. The other things that you can do uh, are things that we've suggested, such as uh, set up a committee, um, start to think of those dig once policies, um, think about how. Uh, you can uh, facilitate uh, ISPs in the community. Um, but basically the, the CRTC target is a regulatory target. And it's something that the government of Canada is driving all of, all of the country towards. Um, so it is fair to say that all Canadians at some point, if that policy is to be a success, will have 5010 access. Um, just a reminder from Helen that Sierra data is at a cost, but where they get it from is free and there's access to it here. Measurement Lab, thank you very much, Helen. Mm -hmm. We will be sure to put that on. Uh, Helen has been a strong contributor to, to this project and uh, we appreciate uh, having uh, access to her and her knowledge all the time. So thank you, Helen. We will put that up for sure. Yeah, we'll add that into the, the slide deck before we send it out. So thank you. Uh, details on timelines. OK, that's Gilles responding. Um, and uh, and then Denzel Ferguson says, uh, too, rural for, too rural for McDonald's, unfriendly terrain, has the use of hydropoles uh, progressed to those very delinquent areas. Um, I think it's fair to say that hydropoles, we have learned, are a much more complex uh, uh, area than we thought when we first uh, took on this project. It is wrapped up um, in, uh, in user rates for, um, for electricity customers, um, in uh, shareholders for, for Hydro One, of which the province of Ontario is, uh, um, is, a, is a shareholder and that, that value, as well as regulations for electrical safety and uh, the mandated height of those poles. So um, I think it's fair to say that both the government of Ontario, the government of Ontario, Hydro One, and even the OEB are very, very well aware of this, and we have been uh, um, pushing them to try to come up with some solutions. We're optimistic that they are uh, working on those, um, but you know there are, um, as I understand it, hundreds of thousands of hydro poles across Ontario. Um, as a as a, a, a low estimate, and uh, and those poles all cost a, a lot of money um, to to put up, um, and uh, and new poles are needed of a certain height um, to have those attachment rates uh, from an electrical safety point of view. So um, we think there's a, a fair bit of work going on. We're optimistic that uh, that we will get to a point where. It will be solved, but uh, unfortunately, Denzel, I, I can't uh, promise you today or tomorrow that that would be the case. Craig, I just want to, um, I've, I, you'll see the same Q&A Q here. I want to defer that one because uh, I think it's a great point, and I want to just bring up to other folks the details about UBF and ICON as well, but there's one other question in the chat that I, I'd love for yeah. you to take. It says, will a formula be developed yeah, to yeah. which areas will receive priority consideration? If so, what might the factors be? And that's from Darlene Plumley, and I apologize, Darlene, I saw that and meant to, uh, to start uh, answering that earlier. So um, I think it is fair to say uh, that the priority areas right now are those as defined uh, by um, the federal government and, uh, and in some cases the provincial government as having um, inadequate access to connectivity. Um, and it comes back to that mapping process. So if, uh, if you are unconnected um, right now, if, uh, if you're in a remote region and, and unconnected or you have satellite connect connection, but it is spotty at best or um, extremely unaffordable, or if you find that your residents are, um, are having to take on several plans to manage their affordability, 
um, then that is the criteria for priority. Um, the same thing goes for uh, the mapping, which is why uh, we've paid so much attention to mapping and the internet speeds. So um, back to the point about CIRA or, um, or the, uh, the uh, late- M labs. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Uh, that Helen put up M Labs. Um, we want to make sure that uh, that folks are aware of them and doing those sorts of uh, speeds tests to to understand where they are um, on that spectrum of connectivity. Um, until and again, it is up to it is a it is an option for municipalities to become involved. The reality is municipalities have become involved in connectivity because. Um, they haven't seen adequate connectivity in their communities and they're advocating on behalf of residents and businesses. Um, but to the, the degree to which you get involved is, is up to you. Um, and it is based on the level of need in the community and need is defined by affordability, speed and mapping. Um, so as, as well as some other factors. So those gap, uh, those gap factors that uh, Amber was talking about and I think maybe there is an entree to, to something I wanted to raise earlier. Um, we've heard about Blue Skynet. We know about Eorn um, and, and Swift um, in, in certain parts of, uh, in the Eastern and Western parts of the province respectively. Um, these are organizations that have been formed from municipal governments and uh, with a mandate from municipal governments to improve connectivity in their areas. Um, and they help to, to do that sort of uh, work for, um, for their members. And if you have, um, if you live in an area where they are active uh, or in part of their jurisdiction, we encourage you to reach out to them because they are resources. Um, we're not necessarily advocating for a particular model um, at AMO or Roma because our members have all sorts of models from 100% um, market um, to, in certain cases, owning their, um, their own uh, ISPs. Um, and one, uh, one of our members uh, lays fiber and rents it out to the, the private sector to operate. Um, and then there, there are regional models like Eorn and Swift and, and uh, Blue Skynet that try to uh, um, help communities with that sort of access. But, you know, there, there probably is a good business case, um, uh, back to Amber's point about partner, partner, partner. Um, there is a good business case for municipalities in certain regions coming together and, uh, and trying to map out what they want to see um, and, uh, and uh, making sure that they are coordinated with their neighbors to, uh, to one extent or another. So um, I'd encourage you to explore those models that we've put forward there. Um, there's always Barn, which I, I uh, mentioned earlier, um, but, uh, but there are others out there and, uh, and some of them are homegrown. So um, please explore. Thanks, Craig. That was, that's helpful. And, um, and well done getting through all of those. Um, so um, I wanted to give you a sense of um, some of the funding programs that exist. These are meant to be not exhaustive, but I just wanted to um, tell you that based on what you're going to see in the next few slides, they are um, both the, the provincial and federal object, um, sorry, uh, programs, but the specifics really, um, we're going to um, make sure that you have all the links here and we, we really do um, suggest that you, you reach out directly. So on the federal level, this Universal Broadband Fund is something that was launched back in uh, November, so a day ago, as a key component of the strategy. Um, they also have a roadmap for rural Canada. So this is something that um, was announced uh, back in, the, uh, in a previous budget and was, uh, was just launched last month. There is a bit more money than was uh, originally committed to. And so they've committed 1.75 billion over the next six years. And what you'll see is sort of three different things that we wanna make sure that, you, that you're aware of. There are different thresholds. So um, what you'll see is obviously 
the the three sort of sub bullets do not add up to 1.75. Um, that is completely um, on purpose. The um, they've done three different streams. So one is large impact projects. They have up to 750 million dollars. These are things that they've just they have not defined as to what large is, but they are looking for the largest impact, uh, whether it be um, entire swaths of highways. Um, entire sort of um, huge regions that are um, are th are not connected up to 5010 currently. There's also up to 50 million available for mobile projects uh, that primarily benefit Indigenous peoples. And then what we really wanted to let you know about is this 150 million that's um, available as part of this rapid response stream. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, for those that um, mentioned Telesat earlier, they did get a 600 million agreement um, with the federal government to secure advanced low Earth orbit or LEO capacity. Um, and so we'll, um, if there's time permitting, we'll, we'll sort of speak to that as well but those are that's a separate and apart from commitment that the government made about the 1.75 very important this rapid response stream um, the, the applications are due January 15th of next year this is Canada wide um, this is a the federal program the application is linked there I will say in the FAQs the government makes it very clear that um, the sooner the better to get your application in. Uh, there is 150 million available for the entire country. Um, part of the application is quite short. Um, it's about five pages. Last I checked and work has to be completed by November 15th. So this is designed for households that are really super close to getting connected, but just are missing a bit of funding. And so that's one pot of money that's available. The rest of the programs, so anything else that does not have to do with the rapid response stream, it seems that they are due February 15th of 2021, which gives you a whole extra month. And the projects can be completed um, anytime between then and March 31st, 2027. So longer term, what I would say, um, based on sort of the time we have today here, look at their website. They have a series of webinars. They've done about four or five already. They're quite good. Um, there's also a lot of frequently asked questions. And the federal government has also provided um, different advisors for provinces. And so the 1-800 um, the number and the email will get delivered to ISED staff staff that are um, putting the, the funding together and they can answer your specific questions on UBF. The other thing that, um, that I sort of put in um, is the availability maps. So these are the maps that they're using to determine whether or not these projects are eligible. Very important, check them out and you can get them. Um, I say no more hexagons with an exclamation mark because it's something that we had certainly advocated for, um, for the removal of this 25 square kilometer hexagon model that they were using, which used to suggest that if one house in that hexagon was, uh, was provided with service, that economically it would mean that the rest of them would eventually get connected. That has gone. So um, what they've done now is they've replaced the mapping to 250 meter road segments, which are much, uh, you, can, you can zero in much more, which we think is great and, and should be applauded for that. There's also the eligibility mapping tool and they've provided a, a video of sort of how you can use it. And so when we send out the, the, um, the slide deck, we'll, we really do um, encourage you to check out some of these links. The ICON program is improving connectivity in Ontario program, so obviously provincial. Um, it is something that the province has been working very hard on since July 2019 with their um, announcement of the broadband cellular action plan. It's called Up to Speed. It's linked there. Since then, they've really they've announced nearly a billion dollars, which we think is fantastic. Um, if you see the um, the UBF by contrast at 1.75 billion, we think this is an incredible investment, and uh, and we think this. This is really going to, as you'll see, the ICON program doubled in size. So it went from 150 million, which is the same exact same amount of rapid response stream, but it is federal. So it's it takes a little while to sort of differentiate those things. But now the, the ICON program does have um, 300 million attached to it. And then uh, last month as well, they committed an additional 680. So, so the extra 150 to double the ICON program was announced in November. The other 530 million we don't have details on or how they're allocating that money yet, uh, but intake, intake rather for ICON remains open. And so the, the application guide is, is there for you as well. There is, um, as Craig and I were, were 
quick to jump on this, um, you can stack the funding. And so um, the federal government and ICON representatives are best to sort of explain the specifics about how those work. Um, but recognizing we're at sort of 121 and, and want to make uh, some time for the last questions. I'll leave this up and, and uh, just to let you know, the webpage does exist on Roma's webpage. It has the primer and the roadmap that we've spoken about today. Um, Roma does have a Facebook page, so you're welcome to, to join on that. And then the thing that's really interesting is the fact that connectivity is going to be a focal point of programming at the Roma conference, which is just, uh, I think, a month, two months away. So it's going to be the, the 25th and 26th of January 2021. We have two interesting concurrent sessions that are going to happen. Um, and that's, that is the getting connected practical steps that communities can take to close the divide. And then the second one is about how communities and industries can work better together. And I will say that Telesat, um, Cradle Point um, are two companies that will be there as well as Hydro One. Um, is in one and the other one is going to be CIRA, which is the Internet Registration Authority that we spoke about is one option for, for mapping and SENGEN, which is the Next Generation Center of Excellence. And they are um, they're currently providing some funding for micro projects. So this is the piece about the other um, type of funding that exists. So even uh, outside of ICON and, uh, and UBF, there seems to be some interest available to provide uh, for shovel worthy projects. So uh, stay tuned for more on that. The other thing I'd say is um, we've, we're creating a database of folks just to make sure that um, if, as other webinars, as Craig and I sort of talk about what 2021 looks like, um, if you want to be included on sort of um, more in-depth emails from Craig and I as staff, happy to do that. Just just send um, that uh, that link a note. It goes right to my email. So um, I will work with, uh, with Brittany from Roma, who's fantastic, and make sure that everyone gets the the information. But with that, um, we just wanted to to thank you. And I will. Um, I'm not sure, Craig, if you've seen if there are other questions that we want to. So we have uh, we have two questions that I, I think we should address uh, uh, quite uh, uh, directly. Um, the last one's from Bev Holmes, uh, who asks who should be completing the rapid response uh, stream application. Um, municipalities or providers. Um, and I think the answer is uh, it depends on who has a project that's ready to go. The rapid response stream, as the name would indicate, is about projects that are um, able to be put in place um, to be completed and get improved connectivity in the next year. Um, if a municipality has a project uh, that's ready to go, um, they are eligible to apply. Um, most likely it would be a municipality working with a provider. Um, and in some cases it would, uh, or in, in many cases, it might be a private company. Um, but the idea is it's quick, um, uh, quick wins to improve connectivity um, and, uh, and in areas where uh, it's identified that those, uh, those connections or connect that connectivity is lacking. Uh, based on those uh, criteria that we spoke about before. Um, so I hope that answers that question, Bev. And then I just wanted to quickly address uh, Suzanne uh, Dion's question um, about, uh, and I, this is something I, I referred to earlier, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand what I was saying, Suzanne. Um, so, so everyone's aware, Suzanne asks about uh, um, a major ISP not providing uh, service in the area currently um, has, uh, has made an announcement that it will be uh, creating a project with private funding and a small amount of, uh, of public funding um, to improve connectivity in those areas. Uh, and uh, Suzanne is uh, um, uncertain that, uh, that it will uh, solve the problem. And I think um, that's where uh, councils and the, the resolutions um, that are part of these applications uh, comes into play. Um, I would suggest that you uh, reach out to um, those programs uh, and those uh, the, the federal and provincial uh, programs that uh, um, Amber provided you the information for um, previously. Uh, I'd suggest you reach out to them um, and, uh, and make sure that you've done your due diligence in terms of, um, of whether you think it will solve the problem or not. Um, I, I think you, you probably need to do that. So 
Um, that would be my advice to you. Uh, I know that there's probably, uh, there are probably other people in your situation, which is why I wanted to, to address that. Um, but uh, um, at the same time, uh, the funding would be awarded based on a, a, a very thorough evaluation of what, uh, what could be done um, and whether it would improve the outcomes. So I think that's it for our questions. And we are, I by my clock, a whole four minutes in advance of, of when we promised to get you out. Um, Craig, can I you. just yeah, can I just absolutely. jump in with just a couple tips? Uh, this is something that we've heard um, from some folks. Just to let you know, for the ICON program um, and also for UBF, municipal councils are being asked to provide letters of support. Um, some I've heard are being asked to sign exclusivity agreements to suggest that um, providing support for one would preclude you from another one. That is not something that um, is certainly necessary for, uh, for those programs. So we wanted to let you know that. And also there is no requirement for other either fund to provide your own municipal funding towards those projects. So just to let you know, um, really important points, you should not be signing any exclusivity agreements. The idea about the municipal so Municipal support is to help with government when they're evaluating your projects to make sure that you are on board with with companies coming in. Um, but you can sign as many as, as you want, quite frankly. So that's that's yeah, it. Course. Yeah. So um, so with that, I just I wanted to thank Craig. Um, it's uh, it's hard to go through these these questions and sort of answer them yourself. And uh, and it's tough sometimes to not hear other people's voices. So certainly um, we want to thank you all for um, for staying on and, and appreciate this is the first attempt that we've done um, on broadband directly uh, through webinars. So we'd be interested in your thoughts of of whether it worked, what we could do better. Um, you know, we've got our emails up here. And if there's there's things offline that you want to share with us or give us a shout were certainly um available and and craig did you no i uh okay. i wanted to to say absolutely if there's something that you hated um <laughs> I, I suppose we're open to that as well um so please uh, please send us an email but hopefully everyone's uh, relatively satisfied and uh, um, back to where i started i hope we have given you an idea of the um, municipal policy and governance lens the options and levers in in front of municipalities and the process that you can follow um, when you're starting to think about connectivity, realizing um, that it is not indeed your, uh, your uh, mandated responsibility. So thank you to Amber um, for, for doing a lot of the heavy lifting on uh, today and also uh, generally speaking, and I hope it's, uh, it's been really uh, helpful to everyone today. Excellent. Thank you very much. I hope that you all have a great uh, afternoon. Take care.